Well, uh, thank you very much. I mean, it's uh, very interesting. I gone through the book. I mean, the the first uh, Bhagavad Gita I read about forty five years back was from uh, Sri Radha Krishna, and it was really nice. Mm -hmm. But over a period of time, as you have pointed out in your book, and you have really made those corrections. I mean, they are very essential because otherwise it looks like. Uh, Maybe it's not his fault. It was in times when he had to sort of maybe relate to the Abrahamic religions and he tried to be aligned there. That's right. But later on when I used to read that, it used to repel me. <laughs> and uh, this particular book, I read it, and particularly the interpretation of each of the words that you mentioned in... Uh, some pages. It's really fantastic. I mean, uh, we are really grateful to you for putting the book Bhagavad Gita in this particular form. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, I'm going to ask this of Professor Jeffrey Armstrong, but also uh, I would like Dr. Sachidanan Joshi and uh, Professor Sudhir Laral's views on this. Is there one Hindu worldview? And if not, if there is, a, is there only one Hindu worldview? And if not, are there any contesting positions on this? This is an excellent question. The reason I said a certain number of Sanskrit words to be the uh, unvarying basis, even those words, as I'm sure you know, are capable of multiple explanations, but in their primary usage, there is not much argument. So if I say moksha means you have many lifetimes, as many as you'd like, uh, I like to say I was first a born again Christian, now I'm a born again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, Hindu. So that's what moksha implies, that you are here to experience something, and at a certain point you can decide to leave. That word is not really confusing. But there are gradations of moksha, and there's nuances to the word. We don't want those to get lost in the process. So we give it its primary meaning. And that primary meaning, think of it as a chunk of Brahman. Because isn't that what the Akshar Brahman is? As you suggested earlier when I asked about the alphabet, they are chunks of Brahman. And therefore, each of the letters in the, in the Sanskrit alphabet are a bit of Brahman coming down here. And I was going to tell you about video and Veda. So the word Veda means to see or to illuminate so you can see. And the the English word video is directly from that. Yeah. So movies, videos are all taken from the, the Veda word. But if I say that about that word, I haven't exhausted it, but it's clear enough that it can be used as the primary meaning. So let's say even primary meanings are worth arguing about, but not debating. There's a couple primaries. And so in this way, each of those words acts as a light, like the lights above us right now, acting independently, but all in quality the same. That is what I foresee. And they will illuminate everything in that way. So excellent question. And later on, we'll get into the details, just like with my professor of Sanskrit. If you wanted more detail, you could have it. Um, but it, it doesn't contradict where we began the process. Do you want me to respond? Thank you. Uh, you asked about, uh, is there a one Hindu worldview, is it? OK. So the basic philosophy of Hinduism is that ekam sat vipra bahuda badanti. Truth is only one. So religion, which is sanatan, is only one. You may have variations, you may have views. So if we are talking about, and I am not talking about Hindu worldview, because for me, there is sanatan dharma, which is much older than the Hindu view. So when we talk about the philosophy which prevailed on this land has been Sanatan. 
Hindu is a world which was world which was given to us by foreigners who came from other side of Sindhu. They called us Hindu. So you go back to history. I may be wrong, but I I would like to be corrected. But before the invaders came to India, there was no word such as Hindu. In no text, no ancient text, you would find Hindu as a word. It is a later addition to our culture. And Sanatan Dharma always says, "Ekam sad vipra bhuda vadanti." So truth is only one. That's my point of view. And uh, although there is no uh, much scope to add on this, uh, to luminaries have already shed much light on it. Luminaries shed light on it. <laughs> ah, <laughs> but just to add one uh, from our Puranic literature, ekam sat premna bahuda bhavati. That is, he is the one, but uh, out of affection, prem, he manifests himself as many. So that's I think he was alluding to. I do. Thank you. He's leading me on, <laughs> and on, and on. If I say to you, none of us exist, what would your answer be? Your answer should be, who says? <laughs> Checkmate in one. You cannot deny that you exist, because you have to be you to deny that you're you. The English language and most languages can't handle this conversation. Achintya Beda Abeda Tattva, or Advait or Dvait, at each time, we're taking one of the primary angles on these great perspectives, on these words and ideas. So. Well, that's why Madhva was like this. He was saying, look, difference is real, difference is real, difference is real. Don't tell me it's all one and there's no distinctions. Because you can't tell me that without distinctions. Are you making a distinction about there being no distinctions? Do you get it? So, in this conversation, we have to be trained, and this is what the Acharyas do. They train us in this discourse. They train us in this understanding. And of course there are layers to reality that one word doesn't completely encompass. But there's a place of beginning, there's a next step and a next step. And the name for this, and this is a very important word, watch what happened to it, is Adhikari. If you meet someone, before you start telling them Veda, you need to ask them some questions and determine their Adhikari. In the Greek, it was called edukare, to bring forth from within. And in modern days, it's called education, which means piling a bunch of crap on top of someone. That's passed off as education now. But it's adhikari is what is the level of understanding of the person to whom you're speaking. And that's where the gradient of understanding comes in. Because then, if you're aware of that, you'll proceed step by step and say something and see if you get the right response. And if you don't, you go, okay, but I can't take it to the next step. But if you get the right response, you take it to the next step. That's what our great Acharyas did in standing in a posture. It was Desha Kala Patra. It was the appropriate stance for that moment in history, misconstrued as fundamentally disagreeing with one another, which is not true. Great question. So, well, there's an old saying when there's no questions, everyone agrees. Yes. If we have the time. I knew he was the one more kind of question guy. <laughs> <laughs> He's got that. Just a brief one, right? <laughs> He's got uh, yeah, one. it's a brief one. I mean, uh, of course. Uh, uh, you may not remember, we met about five years back in Pune hmm. on that Vishwa Vedic Vigyan Samelan. Okay. Yeah, the, that yeah. was where you uh, mm. also spoke. I spoke there about, uh, you know, the 
Vedic science and the challenges we are faced with because I think a lot of things have got lost in translation. And that's why one book, uh, say for example, uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, which is the one which I subscribe to, uh, says something else. And Vishnu Puran says something else. So I think uh, there is a need to sort of uh, converge. I mean, in that uh, event also in Pune, it was decided that there should be some sort of a Aryan, uh, you know, uh, there used to be discussions in earlier times yes. in Aranya Kshetra where they used to decide finally what is the right thing. Right. Because when I say uh, A is A and B is B and somebody says no, that is C, so we need to sort that out. I think as a sequel to this, we could do that as well. That's right. Thank you. You're, it's a very important point that he's making. And I too was involved, as I said, with the Bhagavad Purana and translating it. But if you, if you think of this in terms of intimacy, so let's take this to another level away from just grammar and just linguistics, though it was important for the discussion about the decolonizing of the first line of literature that's going to go out to the world. There's got to be a, a platform on which their understanding rests. After that, the rest of this conversation unfolds and it unfolds in a remarkable ways. But just to give you one example, and I started to say this earlier, with regard to Sri Saraswati, that you'll notice that there is only three temples in all of Bharat that have she and Brahma together. And this, I believe, is one of the biggest misunderstandings in Vedic civilization. It was that when Brahma created everything, he created Saraswati because she's his Shakti, and that he then had sexual relations with her, and therefore he's a pedophile or incestuous, and therefore he was taken out of the temples. Mm -hmm. A gross misunderstanding of the levels of understanding that are being presented to us, because we're not learning what we should learn, which is the three departments of creative process, bringing everything into being in a variety of ways. And another book that's related to this is the Kama Shastra which is not a sex manual, as the New Age movement would have us understand. It's a beauty manual. It's about aesthetics, and aesthetics is not the raw and now terrible and pornographic sexuality, which sometimes the Vedic culture is accused of, because it showed beauty in such a refined way. But if the people looking are not refined, they don't understand it, and they turn it into what they think. So this is a very important topic and you're involved in it by being in an arts-based organization, it's aesthetics is the best English word to talk about this, mm -hmm. that you're bringing aesthetics back, and it's a, it's a matter of refinement. It's not a blunt instrument. It's not just one understanding. It's the whole shading. Ask any artist. Ask any poet. Oh, I thought you never would. All right, I will do a one quick song. When I met my guru, he explained to us that we come to the guru like a caterpillar. And you know the word caterpillar is cater and pillage. So it's all about eating. And what do we say? The things we do until we have a guru? Eat, sleep, mate, and defend? <laughs> right? That's it. So those are the four human activities. So what my guru said is that there was a caterpillar, and then he wrapped himself up and became a pupae, a, a sort of pupil, maybe? And then he became a butterfly. And so when I did this rock opera with my uh, musician friend, Michael Cassidy, uh, he made the music and I wrote the lyric and it was an offering to my guru. And it was the first poem I wrote when I went into the ashram. So because we're overdue, I'll hand it back over after singing you a song. Ready? And nowhere near as beautiful as yours. <laughs> a caterpillar changed his mind and woke to find himself refined. His old self had to die for him to be a butterfly. He tired of walking on the ground 
and so around himself he wound a screen of silken strands, a veil untouched by human hands. Then something subtle changed within, reflected by his changing skin. He had a change of heart and wished to play another part. If, like that worm, my Atma can fly, a rainbow-colored butterfly upon the winds of time, then I with wings of gold will climb beyond this burning dark abyss up to that land of love and bliss where grows a flower sweet. I'll fly to Krishna's lotus feet and there I'll live eternally my Atma at last from matter free. A song will fill the sky, the love song of a butterfly. <laughs> and so, the last thing I add to that song is about a year ago, I was reading a book on psychology, and I found out that psychoanalysis was a word made up by Sigmund Freud. The meaning of the word is suke, is the goddess of the butterfly in Greek. If there's a tree with beautiful flowers and butterflies, it's suke. And so suke analysis, psychoanalysis, according to Sigmund Freud, means freeing the butterfly. So, with that, thank you very much for this opportunity.